Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Amid ongoing chaos in the Middle East, the region has become a so-called playground for both international and regional powers. During today's program, we will discuss the current relations between the United States and Russia, and whether the strained relations between those two powers further harms the challenges ahead to de-escalate the region. To discuss today's program, I'm joined here in the studio by Ms. Sleer, uh, Paula Sleer, who is a Middle East Bureau Chief of Russia today. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Mr. Edgar Levkovich, who is a Middle East analyst. Welcome. <laughs> Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of the current situation. Well, obviously, uh, President Vladimir Putin has seized the strategic initiative a while ago, perhaps even two years ago. And uh, he's still in the driver's seat as far as what is happening in Syria and other uh, places uh, uh, is going. However, unexpected domestic repercussions from the uh, Putin-Trump relationship are now clouding the response that the Trump administration is trying to come up with vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia. And because the priorities are not synchronized, the United States, um, first and foremost, wants to get rid of ISIS, of Daesh, while for Russia, there are other priorities which we will go into later. There are problems in the relationship between these two powers. Ms. Slear? Yes, I'd agree with that. I would say that the Russians, first and foremost, are quite surprised at the moment how things stand vis-a-vis -vis Putin and Trump. I think they were expecting a much better reaction from the American side once Trump was elected. And I think they are perhaps disappointed. The two leaders to date have only had three phone calls. There haven't been any meetings. And I think that they are now more cautious about what is going to be their relationship with America moving forward. How that impacts in terms of the Middle East will be interesting. And of course, put into that the idea that no one really knows how Trump is going to manage the Middle East moving forward. There's a lot of questions that people have. Mr. Lefkowitz? It's interesting because before his election, uh, President Trump spoke very positively about Putin. And I think there was a great expectation that this would be a warm and fuzzy relationship. And instead, uh, the geopolitical gravity has taken them completely apart. Uh, first and foremost, of course, because of the um, <coughs> the allegations of Russian interference in the U.S. election. And then, of course, with the American at uh, attack on Syria. So you have a situation where... Uh, I think that there's a complete uh, flip of the coin in what people were expecting and what the reality currently is. Well, we'll try to identify the various uh, cur uh, current affairs that are uh, happening uh, both in Syria and in Iraq, also in the Astana talks and so on. But uh, I would like to touch on uh, a statement by Jordan's King, Abdullah II, who in both meetings uh, together with uh, President uh, Putin in Moscow, as well as a meeting that he had uh, earlier last month in uh, 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 Washington with President Donald Trump, he declared that the peace in the Middle East cannot be achieved or the de-escalation of the Middle East unless both powers, the United States and Russia, come to terms with uh, working together in bringing about a viable solution. Uh, how much of a reality is this when the regional actors actually identify the great demand of those two major powers working together? It rings true. And um, during the uh, Soviet Union era, um, one uh, used to say that there is no uh, peace without the United States and no war without the Soviet Union in the Middle East because the Soviets started meddling in the region in the mid-50s and only after the Soviet Union disintegrated um, in the late 1980s um, did peace between Israel and Jordan as well as in other uh, parts of the region uh, came to uh, fruition. Now, one should look at the stated doctrine of both countries because doctrine drives what the military uh, forces do, how they equip themselves, and how they deploy. President Putin, a couple of years ago, came out with a statement uh, which he titled the military doctrine, the military strategy of the Russian Federation. And in this very long document, number one is what he perceives as the NATO threat. He is still afraid that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, led by the United States, wants to encircle Russia 
to bring forces to the adjacent uh, neighboring countries, and he looks at the United States especially as a threat. And the mirror image of that is what the Department of Defense in the United States, which is yet to change the doctrine because uh, Trump has not put out any new document, the uh, Pentagon sees Russia as its number one threat too. So you have the makings of uh, a very intense rivalry unless the two leaders meet and change it. Ms. Lear? Yes, you do have this intense rivalry. But if we look at the playing ground of the Middle East specifically, you have two very different kind of patterns happening. I think on the one hand, Russia as we've seen for quite some time, is certainly getting more involved in this region. Again, it's important to say it's not the Russians' first foreign policy priority. Putin is much much more concerned about neighbors closer to him, about Europe, about the former Soviet states. But certainly he sees the Middle East as a stomping ground, a place where he wants to play a role because it puts him bigger on the international stage. Now parallel that with the United States, and from certainly from the time of Obama, and again, it's uncertain what's going to happen with Trump, they are withdrawing from the region. So they are feeding into Putin's ability and Russia's ability to play a more central role. So yes, of course, you have the rivalry between the two, but it's rivalry that's happening in a region where at the moment they both have very different dynamics that Play. Mr. Levkovich? I think that it's clear that indeed you need to have both players involved uh, in order to bring about stability in the region, uh, specifically, uh, first and foremost, I would think also with Syria. And I think that both sides recognize this as well. You had the two different tracks going on, uh, the U.S. backed track in Geneva, which basically failed to stop uh, the violence and the crisis in Syria, which was also backed by the UN. And then you had the Russia backtrack uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, which uh, is still alive, but just barely. But it didn't make progress as well because the U.S. wasn't involved. So I think there is recognition on both sides that you do need to have certainly the U.S. involved, even though Russia wants to be part of it to bring about stability. Mr. Oren. There's a question of... um Who makes policy? It's uh, obviously Putin himself in Russia. Um, He is the uh, supreme leader um, who is no challenger. In the United States, it's uh, much more complicated. First of all, because you have Congress vis-a-vis the executive branch, and many senators resent uh, Trump's uh, policies or his inexperience. For instance, Senator McCain of his own party, a very prominent armed services committee uh, member. Uh, He is against uh, the Trump administration as being too much pro-Russian. Within the executive branch, you have two generals, retired General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, and uh, General McMaster, the National Security Advisor, who are calling the shots. Secretary of State Tillerson, because he was suspected of being too much of a pro-Russian force uh, coming out of his business uh, experience, is now uh, bending over backward not to look as if he's uh, for Russia. So the net effect is that Russia has suffered rather than gained from the election of Donald Trump. Nevertheless, when we're looking on the regional actors, uh, whether it be Israel, whether it be Egypt, Jordan, uh, and so on, we can see that as opposed to previous years uh, where each country used to choose one side, whether it be Russia or the United States, now all countries are trying to maneuver themselves in both Moscow and Washington to try and please both sides. How much of a... uh, challenge is to strain relations for the regional actors to try and maneuver themselves in order not to get burned by either side. I don't necessarily think it's a burden that the relations are perceived to be strained. I think it could be an opportunity for countries in terms of where to place themselves. We made the point about the rivalry between them. I wanted to make I wanted to say that it's not just the rivalry between Russia and the United States. It's also how the regional players here perceive that rivalry and, and and where they want to position themselves. So how, for example, they can take advantage. Let's take Israel, for example. On the one hand, Russia supports the Palestinians at all the United Nations Security Council meetings. Israel knows that, but it understands where Russia is coming from and that it needs to do that. At the same time, it's an open secret that Russia knows when Israel carries out airstrikes in Syria that it never claims responsibility for, but it is understood to, to be responsible for. It never asks questions about that either. So it's, it's politics. It's countries understanding 
the, the interests of the United States or Russia of the regional power and learning to adapt and abide by them. So it really is each country looking after its own self-interest. Mr. Levkovich? And I also believe that <coughs> the mantra of America first, which was so much talked about uh, leading up to the election and even in President Trump's inaugural address, has proven uh, to be passé already, <laughs> if, if at all, um, and not only outdated, but not in effect. And basically, you have a situation where the classic case of the old generals are the ones who are running the show. And Trump's foreign policy has gone along those very lines. It hasn't been America first at all. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Oren, when we're looking at uh, Trump's anticipated visit to Saudi Arabia to start with, and then later to Israel and, and Rome and, and Brussels for the NATO meeting, uh, during his visit to uh, Riyadh, the capital of Saudi, he is expected to attend a summit of uh, Sunni Muslim countries during which he is expected to hold meetings uh, pertaining to the situation and the rivalry specifically been uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran. This rivalry has also kind of taken a, a, a toll on the rivalry between the United States and uh, uh, Russia when we're seeing Russia siding with the Shiite Muslims, uh, uh, also uh, uh, with Iran as its leader and the United States more directing its uh, attention to Saudi Arabia. Is this as part of this broader rivalry between those two powers? Uh, not necessarily. Russia, of course, ha has a Muslim uh, problem of its own, a Muslim minority, which it doesn't want uh, to see radicalized uh, and uh, violent, doesn't want to see more uh, uh, independence uh, or subversion uh, movements. Uh, while for the United States, of course, foreign fighters coming home and uh, terror acts are uh, a security concern, but not uh, so paramount. But uh, there is another uh, dimension here. The, uh, the Russians can harass and interfere with what is happening if you take the Israeli case or the Israeli actions in, in Syria. But they cannot deliver any Arab party to the table. The United States supports Israel to the tune of some $4 billion a year. Israeli defense depends on American aid. We take it for granted because this has been the norm for the last several decades. But if you take this aid away, which you won't for the next decade uh, anyway, because there is a memorandum of understanding, Israel's defense uh, would be uh, at peril. Nevertheless, the United States cannot deliver Israel either. So both countries are acting as if uh, they have clients. Obviously, Syria under Assad is dependent on Russia, but Russia cannot uh, bring Assad to the table if, for instance, out of the political discussion or the discussion about the political future of Syria also emerges some talk between Syria and Israel on the Golan Heights in return for peace. Neither uh, power can deliver its client. Ms. Lear? Look, right from his election promises, Trump was very critical of the Iranian deal. So certainly part of the reason he's visiting Saudi Arabia as the first country on his first foreign trip is to build the coalition against Iran. But I would agree with what Amir says. I don't think it necessarily means that Russia and the United States are lining up to have this Sunni-Shia kind of... Um, rivalry, if, for lack of a better word. I mean, the Russians have been courting the Saudis. What I do think is also interesting is that you have the Russians courting previous American allies in the region. I mean, the Russians have been moving closer to Egypt, to Turkey, to Israel, as I mentioned. So I think it kind of crosses borders in that respect. And I think what, what we anticipate to see out of Trump's visit is going to Saudi Arabia, building up this anti-Iran coalition, building Muslim support for Islamic terrorism and the fight against Islamic terrorism and then something that he's placed high on his agenda is trying to reach a breakthrough in the Israeli-Palestinian talks. And it might be that he wants to put the Saudis on a back foot and say, well, I'm going to Israel from here. What exactly can I tell them you're prepared to offer? Mr. Levkovic? And I think that the upcoming visit by President Trump highlights more than anything the difference between him and former President Obama, that he specifically chose to go to Saudi Arabia first, as opposed to Obama, who went to Egypt. And then that he immediately is following his trip to Saudi with a visit to Israel, which Obama deliberately omitted, even though there was a deep feud within his administration way back when, 
whether he should come to Israel at the time right after his Cairo speech. And then, of course, he chose not to. So he's highlighting that he's going to these countries, and then, of course, he'll go on to the Vatican. But he's highlighting that he's going to these countries that have been the longstanding allies of the U.S. in the region. Mm -hmm. And this is the big divide, of course, uh, and the other side being, you know, the the enemies of the U.S. led by Iran and and the Shiite divide. So I think that that is is very... uh, eye-opening and revealing that Trump, who is loath to leave the United States, is choosing to enter the dangerous waters of the Middle East on his first foreign trip. Nevertheless, during the uh, uh, tenure of uh, uh, President Barack Obama, or uh, the long uh, presidency uh, that he had, uh, his trip to Turkey to start with, then to Saudi Arabia, and then to Egypt, did signal something to Israel when they didn't stop by or just uh, even fuel their planes in uh, Tel Aviv just to show the sign that we're here with you and we support you. But at the same time, President Trump does show a lot of willingness to bring about a regional coalition of uh, regional partners, including Saudi Arabia and Israel together on one table, something that is unprecedented. Nevertheless, Israel does uh, declare on several occasions that uh, it is indeed informing Moscow on every action that is taking in Syria and nothing that it does there is uh, uh, something uh, under the table uh, as part of the uh, coordination agreement or coordination mechanism that was implemented uh, a few uh, uh, years or uh, months back. Uh, Ms. Lear, do you believe that Russia looks at the United States' renewed interests in the Middle East and renewed policy in the Middle East as a kind of challenge when it comes to the vacuum that was and the vacuum that is right now? To be honest, working for a Russian channel, the sense I get is that the Russians just are not sure at the moment where Trump is coming from. Following on from your comment earlier, I think there's also a sense that maybe Trump is not being allowed to be Trump because of all the American foreign policy bureaucrats that that are maybe reining him in. You made the point about Trump attacking in Syria. Uh, To be fair, I think that really did take the Russians by surprise. I think they felt it was a a frontal attack against them. And they felt that it it wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary to launch a strike in Syria that the Russians interpreted could, uh, certainly didn't interpret, felt um, inflamed tensions between them. So I'm not sure that they would necessarily say that Trump is starting to move back into the Middle East. I think it's more accurate to say that no one really knows how to read Mm. Trump. And I want to go back to the point I made right at the beginning. There is a sense of disappointment in in Russia. uh, Putin has elections coming up next year. He needs to show um, that he is a strong man and that Russia is on an equal footing on the international arena when it comes to the United States. And certainly that's what they're telling the Russian public. And yet again, here you have Trump, who's been in office for quite some time, has met with international leaders, and hasn't yet seen it fit to fit into his diary a meeting with Putin. But Mr. Owen, when uh, you spoke uh, earlier about uh, Israel's reliance on U.S. aid when it comes to its military at least qualitative edge in this region. Uh, Of course, it's also self-sustainable to a certain degree, but uh, not when it comes to its uh, clear superiority uh, in the air. Uh, Do you believe that its shift to try and find uh, uh, additional friends, uh, whether it be in the East, as Prime Minister Netanyahu has specified on several occasions, whether it be India or China or Russia in uh, several cases, as well as uh, what uh, the Foreign Minister of Egypt, uh, Samih Shukri, has stated, that they don't want to put their foreign uh, uh, policy eggs all in the same basket with the United States, but try to diversify to the East as well, as well as uh, uh, Moscow. Do you believe that the United States will now exert certain pressures based on this aid that it has uh, been given to various countries in the region in order to gain them back into their own basket and not share them with anybody else? Well, what the um, Egyptian foreign minister said is a nice turn of phrase, but the fact is that both the eggs and the basket are made in America. And you can't find uh, other products uh, with any other uh, supplier. Israel is de-conflicting with uh, Russia in Syria. Um, It does not give advance notice, but it makes sure that it does not tangle with Russian fighters. The uh, Russians did not like Netanyahu's cheering on uh, Trump after the attack. They thought it it was unwise that Netanyahu uh, has butted in 
uh, in a place uh, he had no, no reason uh, to go into. And uh, regarding what uh, Paula said about uh, Putin and the uh, elections he's facing uh, next year, Putin has managed to um, punch above his weight. Russia has problems, but nevertheless, Putin has managed to concentrate Russian power in the very spots he wanted to, Ukraine or, or Syria, while with the United States or the West in general, the, um, the whole is less than the sum of its parts. Uh, only this week, uh, a report came out in Stockholm regarding defense expenditures in the West. It's 12 times the defense expenditures in Russia, but you wouldn't know it from the policies of the countries involved because they are not coordinated, they are not led. Perhaps in the NATO summit, which you mentioned in Brussels, they will find some common ground. Mr. Levkovitz, uh, I'd like to turn the attention to the way the United States perceives this relationship with Russia. Of course, Trump has made it no secret that he is interested in uh, normalizing relations with Moscow, trying to find common ground in order to uh, truly elevate both countries to the place that he believes they, they should be. Do you believe that uh, because of all this scrutiny that is uh, laid upon him pertaining to his aspiration and, and trying to demonize his efforts to try and normalize relations with Russia, is that part of the challenge that has created this friction and uh, ultimately challenged uh, those two powers in regional affairs? I think basically it was because of the ongoing investigation into uh, Russia's suspected involvement in the American election that has put a hurdle and has put really uh, Trump in a situation whereby he couldn't pick up the phone and, as you say, invite Putin over uh, for a tete-a-tete in the same way that he hosted the leader of China at his resort uh, in Florida as he hosted leaders in the region, Prime Minister Netanyahu, even President Abbas, King Abdullah, and, and other world leaders. He just couldn't invite Putin because of all the scrutiny still ongoing over Russia's suspected involvement uh, in one way or the other in the outcome of the American election. Uh, I think that that's a reality that Trump is forced to face. Uh, I do believe they probably will meet in, in the coming months, perhaps, as you mentioned, in, in July, uh, this summer in Germany. But for the time being, it was impossible for him to do anything at this point just because of the political sensitivity. If, if the investigation goes on, they will only meet in the fall in New York uh, during the General mm. Assembly of the UN. Ms. Lear. But why then launch an attack in Syria? You know, is that is that Trump acting on what Trump wants to do? A strong man showing that this is a red line and he's going to face off Assad? Or is it him... Has it not changed, mm -hmm. though, the perceptions of uh, the way the United States conducts its dealings in the from, Middle East? From the Russian point of view, it has them confused. I think that they, they, they were taken by surprise that he launched that strike and they took it as, a, as an affront against them. But the attack... Uh, the American attack in Syria showed more clearly than ever before that this is not President Obama, that this is the antithesis of President Obama. What took President Obama six years of hand-wringing and consideration, should I, shouldn't I, and in the end, of course, not doing anything, took uh, Trump just a matter of days, mm -hmm. if not hours, but it to act. Correct, but it contradicts the, 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 the perception that here's somebody who wants to work with the Russians, who wants to reach some kind of consensus. Nevertheless, he did uh, inform the Russians prior to the attack, so it does show some kind of... Not from a Russian perspective. From a Russian perspective, it was, you know, it was, it was launched without any kind of objective evidence on the ground mm -hmm. that Assad was responsible for it. It was them getting unilaterally involved. They don't perceive that kind of forewarning in any kind of positive flavor whatsoever. But it's uh, still the exception to the rule, this uh, attack, which, um, as we have heard, uh, and this is not only proverbial, had some family connection to it. His daughter, Ivanka, uh, told him uh, uh, her reaction to the uh, uh, video yes. of suffering children. And the administration, as distinct from the president, has gone back and tried to calm down the situation in other regions too. In Korea, for instance, uh, President Trump made some announcements, but the National Security Council called up its equivalent number in Seoul to say that one should look at the American policy, not only in terms of what the president has been 
at living. He, he, has, he doesn't really go into the particulars of the policy when he makes a statement. Now, one, one other point. Very short. The, uh, the Russians, and especially Putin, are not uh, committed to uh, full disclosure and to uh, truth uh, uh, over consequences. When they uh, make a statement as part of, of their doctrine uh, going into the so-called gray zone of uh, special operations, information operations, uh, propaganda, uh, they can uh, twist the truth a bit. A democratic uh, administration, small d democratic, even though a Republican, capital R, Republican administration, must tell Congress and the American people everything. So uh, they are more constrained. Well, we're coming to the end of the program, so I'd uh, like each and every one of you to give uh, a short uh, anticipation for the near future. Ms. Lear, we'll start with you. Well, if we just look at the upcoming visit, I mean, for me, the questions are, what if... What, if anything, is Trump going to say about the move of the embassy that he was threatening to move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? I think that's something that's on people's minds. And also the question as to whether or not he can actually activate change. Is this first foreign policy trip actually going to bring about more than just words? And about the U.S.-Russian relations? About the U.S.-Russian relations, I think it's still a... a something that no one really knows what's going to come out of it. As I said, the Russians are a bit disappointed with where Trump stands at the moment. They intend to remain as involved in the Middle East as they've been, if not more. And they would have hoped that the Americans would move further back. But I think there's still the perception that the Americans will not act unilaterally without informing the Russians at least at least to some extent. They have indeed uh, been very vocal about that, Mr. Lefkovic. I think Trump has proven that he is indeed the wild card that everybody suspected he would be. I think that the strike uh, in Syria showed that he did take the moral high ground, and that was a big surprise to many people, uh, even to many of his uh, opponents and to many of his critics, uh, both in America and around the world. Many in the American intelligence community have praised him for his action on Syria, and I think that the upcoming visit is going to be very, very interesting one way or the other. Might be, be a wild card, but very calculated one, Mr. Oren. You remember the uh, term frenemies, which was in vogue a few years ago. The United States and Russia have to coexist uh, in the world, as well as in the Security Council, where each has a veto, as does China, Great Britain, if it's still great, and, and France. So they will have to coordinate, because whatever Trump is doing in the Middle East will come up for a vote in the Security Council and must be coordinated with Russia. Just for your statement, I do think they're great, but that's a different story. So I'd like to thank each and every one of you, Ms. Paula Slier and Emil Oren for coming here, as well as Mr. Edgar Lefkovic. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.